Hi, and welcome to The Week Ahead. I'm Tony Nash, and I'm joined by Tracy Shukart, Albert Marco, and Sam Rhines. Uh, thanks for joining us. Before we get started, I'd like to ask you to subscribe to our YouTube, YouTube channel and like this video. Helps us out to get visibility, helps you get uh, notifications when we have a new video. So if you wouldn't mind doing that right now, we would be grateful. Also, we're having a flash sale for CI Futures, which is Complete Intelligence subscription product. We forecast about 800 markets, assets, currencies, commodities, equity indices, and a couple thousand economic variables with a very low error rate. We're doing a flash sale right now for about for $50 a month. And you can see the URL right now, completeintel.com slash promo. Uh, it's a limited time flash sale. So please get on that. That's a 90% off rate on our current, uh, on our usual price. So thanks for that. Um, so this week, guys, uh, we saw commodities mooning. We saw exposure to Russia uh, sovereign, really uh, a lot of sensitivity to that. Um, exposure to Russia commercial risk, a lot of sensitivity to that. Obviously, the war in Ukraine uh, is on the top of everyone's mind. Um, but we also had the removal of COVID restrictions in some key U.S. states like New York. Uh, we had uh, Joe Biden speak, give the State of the Union address without a mask on, all of this stuff, easing of national guidelines. So the risk aspect of COVID has gone in the U.S., but there's really, it's largely gone on notice. So while the war rages on overseas, at home, we, we do have some, some regulation getting out of the way. Um, a, a few things we said last week. First, we said that Ukraine would get bloodier and that markets would be choppier, that's happened. We said that equities would be marginally down, that's happened. And we said commodity prices would be higher and that's really, really happened. So um, in all of this, guys, the S&P 500 is only down about 15 points over the past week. Um, so when you guys said it would be down marginally with a lot of volatility, you were bang on there. So, so very good job there. Um, so our first question today is, is really a basic one. And I, I'd really like to get all of your different views on this. Um, when we have geopolitical events like we have now, how do you guys make trading decisions? What, what do you pay attention to? Albert, do you want to get us started? Yeah, I mean, personally, you know, I view the market as uh, we're stuck on repeat right now, especially with the Ukraine and everything. You know, fundamentals to me right now, I mean, honestly, don't really mean much. I mean, we had the jobs number come out and then it was everyone just yawned about it because the nuclear power plants were getting firebombed, you know? So for me, you know, I'm looking for the Fed to support the market to a certain degree and looking for geopolitical news events to come out and just scare the bejesus out of people. Okay. Okay, Tracy, yeah. what are you looking at? Oh, sorry, Sam, what are you looking at? Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll jump in there. 100% agree with Albert. I, I... It's very difficult to trade when the market is just trading on headlines. I mean, it is a straight headline market, and it, you know you can. You know, does oil look great here? Yeah, but you get one good headline saying that it looks like tensions with Russia are declining, and you're going to have a five dollar gap down in oil and probably get stopped out of your position. It, it, to, to me, it's one of those very scary moments for anyone who's trying to trade in that you never know which way the headline's going to come in next, uh, right? Uh, if, you, if you're if you playing headlines, you're going to get in trouble and you're going to get in trouble pretty fast unless you're just getting lucky. So for me, headline-driven markets are mostly about selling ball on spikes and getting out of the way on everything else. Tracy? Uh, well, being that I mostly look at the commodity markets rather than the, the, the broader, well, obviously I look at broader markets, but... <clears throat> For, for what I'm looking at, um, you know, when I see this sort of volatility in the market, I think that I think that you have to have a fundamental grasp of what is going on and what the trade differences are between countries so that you can uh, kind of position yourself for uh, a market change that is not um, subject to volatility, meaning that, you know, you have to know that you know, the oil market is obviously going to be affected, for example, right? And so no matter what, dips are going to be bought in this market. So you have to have a conviction that this is going to be affected until something else changes, right? Yep. If that so makes Tracy, sense. let me let me dig in on that a little bit. You said something about fertilizers. We don't necessarily need to mention a, a specific company here, but 
You said something about fertilizers earlier on Twitter today. Could you use that as an example of the type of analysis that you're talking about? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, we saw the fertilizer markets rise 23% today. Um, Russia is the second largest producer of ammonium, urea, and potash, and the fifth largest producer of uh, processed phosphates. So, and that country accounts for 23% of the global ammonium export market. So what we saw in the fertilizer market was an increase of 23% this week across the globe, not just in the United States. I mean, literally across the globe. So I just, I just wanted to cover this a little bit because, you know, especially in social media, everyone's an expert, right? So everyone's a geopolitical expert. Everyone overnight became, a, you know, a nuclear uh, <laughs> uh, power expert, you know, all this other stuff. And I just don't want our viewers to fool themselves into believing that they can play these markets with certainty. But I like what you guys all said about, you know, you have to have a conviction. Um, you know, you have to have your stops in place. You have to, you know, understand when things are going and headlines could go either way. So there's a huge amount of risk out there, right? Is there anything else on this, Albert? Like, what are you watching on the ground? How do you get information on the ground if you don't have people? Are there reliable sources that you look at without having firsthand research on the ground? No, unfortunately, I don't. I mean, um, we've we've come to the we've come to this point where, uh, you know, that nuclear plant attack, and all of a sudden, people are talking about radiation spikes and so on and so forth. And I actually had to get on Twitter, and I'm just like, everybody, relax. It's right. like, it's like, it's like no, those things can withstand, um, you know, airplanes being hit. You know, a few bullets isn't going to do the job. Um, so for me, I personally have contacts in the region on the ground, both in Ukraine and Georgia. So for me, you know, I, I get, you know, almost on the ground intelligence in real time. So that's how I'm trading, you know, and that's just that's just the reality of it at the moment. You know, the public is not going to be able to get that information. Right. OK, this is great. I, I really appreciate this, guys. I mean, I think this is wisdom that comes from years of trading. But it's also the reality that comes uh, with dealing with geopolitics on a, you know, a very intimate level. So uh, thanks for that. Let's move on to commodities. So, so we've seen commodities, wheat especially, skyrocket uh, this week and last week. Uh, so a couple of questions here. Tracy, if you don't mind starting us off, um, it seems like every commodity was green this week. I know there, there are a few that weren't, but what commodities are impacted most by Russia, Ukraine? Well, so fertilizer, which I brought up earlier, mm -hmm. and then you have aluminum, which was up 14.7% today, we are this week, pardon me, um, we have copper, 9.34%, neon gas, which is something that most people don't look at, um, but Ukraine supplies 90% of the neon gas market for the chip making uh, oh, wow. market. Then we had palladium up 37%, not surprising. Russia supplies 43% of that market. You've been talking um, about palladium for weeks though. So anybody listening to you wouldn't be surprised by this, right? Right, not at all. I've been talking about this for, for a very long time. And actually we're seeing, um, we're seeing uh, platinum get a little bit of a bid because um, if you look at the automotive markets, palladium is a huge thing in a catalytic converter. Right. And so we're starting to see because prices have been so elevated for the last few years, we're seeing automakers finally start to retool a bit. And so that's going to give a little bit of a lift to the platinum market. Um, natural gas obviously is up. Right. We all know about that. Oil obviously up. We have nickel up nine uh, percent. The other interesting thing is coal. Um, Russia is a material coal supplier at 15% of the global market, and Europe gets 30% uh, of their imports from the met coal market from hmm. Russia and 60% from the thermal coal market. And so they're going to be looking elsewhere for other supplies because they don't want to have all their eggs in one basket where you can't have everything in coal and that gas and depend on Russia. It, it, I do want to note on the natural gas market, although there have been rumors Yamal was shut down or whatever, but overall Yamal is only one pipeline into Europe. Uh, gas supplies have still been consistent and steady this whole time into Europe via different pipelines through Russia. So, so um, weird. So, no, so nobody's cut off of, of gas. Right. That's just weird. They're on other sides of a war, but 
one is still supplying the other side energy. I just think that that whole thing is very. Yeah, Tony, you, you know what? You know what concerns me. Actually, this is a question for Tracy too. Um, is like these super spikes in commodities are starting to concern me specifically because of wheat. Because I mean, that's obviously that's food, and you know, once people start, you know, getting stressed on food supplies, you know, problems, can, political problems can happen. I, I think even today, Hungary decided that they cut off all exports of foods. You know, of wheat and grains because of the concern of, of uh, spiking prices. You know, where do we, well, Tracy, well, like, where do we see wheat possibly even topping off at this point, especially if, if Ukraine and um, Russia go at it for the extended period of time, like, you know, say three, three to four weeks? Yeah, I mean, hopefully they, they won't. But as far as that's concerned, which, you know, we're looking at the Black, Black Sea right now. And because exports are halted, because there's a conflict going on, this is what you know. I, I think um, your Euro, European wheat and U.S. wheat has been limit up literally every day this week, mm -hmm. <laughs> right? And so um, that's going to be a problem. That's going to cause inflation, food inflation elsewhere. And let's not forget that you know that's how the Arab Spring started as right. well, right? So. Um, this is very much a concern globally on a macro sense right. on food prices, energy prices, especially when we're looking at kind of a global downturn in, right. in the markets. So, and that's a whole nother discussion we can get in another week, but um, definitely it's a concern right now. Yeah, let's dig a little bit deeper into that. We have a viewer question from uh, ACT. RAM rules. And Sam, can you take a look at this? The, the impact of sanctions uh, on Russia on emerging economies. So where, where are we seeing impacts of, say, wheat prices? Uh, I know Albert brought up Hungary, but, but what are we seeing in, say, emerging markets? And, and are there places that this is already hitting them? Uh, I don't know that there's places that it's already hitting, uh, mostly because you're going to have imported wheat it, you know, it, wheat right now isn't being harvested in Ukraine, Hungary, Russia, etc. Uh, that's going to be more of a late spring summer story uh, when you begin to actually have to import your additional food supplies. Uh, so, where do you, where would you see it? You'd see it in Egypt. Egypt is a significant importer of both Russian and Ukrainian wheat. Um, you're going to see it on the corn side too. It's worth remembering that you, Ukraine is a significant exporter of. Uh, corn, you're going to see it in uh, sunflower oil, which is going to spill over into other markets because you're going to have to, if there is no resolution slash planting season, you're going to have to replace sunflower oil with something else. Uh, so you're going to have uh, that issue uh, to deal with as well. So I don't know that you've seen the spillovers yet. Uh, mm -hmm. You will see spillovers, particularly North Africa, other significant importers of foodstuffs. Uh, the other thing to remember is it could potentially be a marginal benefit to some emerging markets as you see net exporters of oil, uh, next, net exporters of coal, et cetera, become incremental uh, sources uh, for replacement uh, from okay. both Ukraine and, and Russia. So I think it's, it's something to keep an eye on both on the uh, food price front, but also on the front of it's going to be good for some, it's going to be very bad for others. Okay. Okay. Thanks for that. Hey, before we move on from commodities, Tracy, I want to roll back to this viewer question we have from at Younger Bowling. Uh, he asks, what's the, what are the other sources of crude grade wise that can replace Russian crude for US refineries? This is a common question and I'm sure you can answer it very quickly. So where, where else can people look to get Russian grade crude? So where else? I mean, we get kind of the sludgy stuff from them, right? So the best, the best, most convenient, easiest place to get it from is Canada, right? Um, we can get some heavier crude grades from Mexico, but they're having some political problems there and it's come and go. So really the easiest place that we can look to is to Canada. So opening import lines from Canada is really our best option since they're on our border. <laughs> Didn't the U.S. cancel a pipeline from Canada about a year ago? Something um, happened, right? Something in the side, yeah. <laughs> yeah, okay. Uh, okay, thanks for that. And then um, moving to another question, we spoke a bit about China last week, uh, and I'm curious for any further thoughts that the panel has on, has on China in light of last week's, of this past week events. Uh, we do have a viewer question to get us started off. It's from 
uh, HJC Dark Horse One. He says perspectives on Chinese yuan. But before we get into that, um, Tracy, let's talk a little bit about China's energy relationship with Russia. Um, what do you see happening on that front? Right. So, um, I mean, first of all, if we're looking at the oil industry, China is uh, Russia's largest importer, right? And so I think that anything that comes off the market wise um, via the West, that China will gladly scoop up at a $28 discount that they're currently offering, right? And so um, that is, you know, that is interesting in that respect. I, you know, there are still 1.5 million barrels kind of off the market. Nobody, I, I want to stress, nobody has sanctioned oil or energy at all. So far, UK, EU, US. That said, that people are hesitant and anticipating and they're hard, it's hard to get banknotes right now to get um, those deals going through. But, you know, China is definitely their largest trading partner. China definitely loves cheap oil. So yeah, they're going to continue buying from them no matter what. Yeah. Right. So, and are which kind of leads me in. Are there pipelines between Russia and China? Um, there are, but not like. Not enough. Not enough. Okay. But, did did, yeah. did they just cut a deal with for a new pipeline that's going to pretty much be equal? Oh, that's oh, sorry. That's for Nat Gas that equals Nord Stream too. Nat oil. Gas because yeah. he's big on. They're big and on Nat Gas. Didn't but they I mean, also? Did they also come to some agreement recently about buying crude in CNY? Is that? Did that happen in the no, past? No, 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 no. That, that was buying. Happen. That was buying. Um, that was buying jet fuel. Okay. So what they right. said yep. is, if we're in your airport, we'll buy in your currency. If right. you're in our airport, you'll buy in our currency, which okay. is not that big. Literally. Okay. It's not, not so, to big. some people's dismay, the U.S. dollar is still the currency for energy. Yeah, correct. <laughs> <laughs> You're just, you're Since we're talking about currencies, I wanted to ask you, you and I have talked about CNY for a long yep. time. So yes. can you give us kind of some perspectives on that? I know we had a sure. question about that as well. Sure. So uh, CNY, Chinese yuan, is a controlled currency. It's, it's not a freely floating currency. There is an offshore currency called CNH that is, we'll say, marginally floating currency that is linked to the CNY. But uh, the CNY is strictly managed by the PBOC, and when you have a managed currency, uh, it's it's devalued. Okay, it's it's appreciated and it's devalued. Um, and so, what's happened over the last say two years is the CNY has appreciated dramatically, and a big part of that is so that they can buy commodities. Okay, knowing that commodities would spike starting in the second quarter of 2020. China has appreciated the CNY so that they could hoard those commodities, which they've done, okay? What's happened? Well, Chinese exporters have suffered a bit because of the appreciated CNY. They're, on a relative basis, they're paying higher prices, but their exports have been up too, so they're not hurt too much. But we have a lot of things happening uh, in China with a big political meeting in November to where they're starting to spend, in a big way, fiscal spending, We've also expected since probably August of 21, we've been talking about uh, China starting to devalue the CNY in, at the end of second quarter or, early, or end of first quarter or early second quarter of this year. So what that will do is it will make things a lot easier for exporters. Um, and so exporters will be happy. There'll be a lot of fiscal stimulus, a lot of monetary stimulus, so that just in time for this political meeting, everyone domestically in China is pretty happy. So we expect a lot of stimulus and a devalued CNY is a big part of that. And, and just to just kind of jump on that really fast, that's a positive on the US inflation fright, fighting front. A yes. significant positive. Uh, you know, we, we are going yeah, to get- I mean, if you're exporting yeah. deflation, that's fantastic. Yeah. <laughs> exactly, exactly. So when China goes back to, exporting deflation instead of exporting inflation, that's going to be a completely different ball game from what we've seen for the past year and a half. That's a very good thing. Mm -hmm. um, okay, guys, uh, anything else on China? Albert, do you have any, 
Anything on China that you want to add? I, and honestly, it's like for China, I, I don't really see people talking about the fact that this entire Ukraine, China, uh, Ukraine, Russia war has been a boon for China. Yeah. I mean, they're getting they're getting cheaper cheaper commodities. They're getting a tighter relationship with Russia. Although, I mean, it's going to be argue, it's going to be debatable that Russia is going to be a, a shell of what it was after all this. But still, I mean, for for China, you know, they're sitting pretty at the moment. I mean, any 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 other place in the world where the Russians had their hands in the domestic economies of countries that China also did is now going to have to take a step back and allow the Chinese to to get their get their banks financing, get their bank financing the different countries' projects. I mean, it's going to be unbelievable for China in the next couple of years. Yeah, I wonder if the Belt and Road is going to rebuild Ukraine. <coughs> I mean, it's a cynical question, but uh, you know, I think it's it's an opportunity for China to do uh, to do something like that on infrastructure. They're gonna they're gonna have to because Russia is going to have nothing left economically. Right. Yep. And to begin with, it was a one point five eight trillion dollar economy. So, like, yeah, right. But yeah. yeah, there's a. I mean, it's a very detailed answer to that simple question. But yeah, I mean, I think it is a, a medium term opportunity for China as well, not just in getting cheap commodities now or discounted commodities, we'll say now, mm -hmm. but also long term for their financial system, for their infrastructure system and other things. Right. Yeah, OK, so what guys are we looking forward to in the week ahead? Tracy, what do you see over the next week? Again, I I'm going to say volatility. I think markets are going to be very volatile, just like we saw this last week. I mean, you know, we had eight to ten dollar moves in crude oil at the blink of an eye. I think we're going to continue to kind of see that in the commodities markets um, until there's some sort of resolution to, uh, you know, this Ukraine Russia crisis, because there's too many commodity sectors involved in this. Right. Sam, same for you, but you talked about the kind of twos and 10 years a couple of weeks ago, and I'm curious what your observation is there in addition to other things. Yeah, the two, I mean, the front end of the U.S. curve has been nuts this week, and I, th I think you can kind of attribute that back to two reasons. One, you sucked out all of the Russian uh, reserves uh, from being able to participate in the market, period, uh, full stop. Uh, and you probably have a significant amount of hoarding on the front end uh, from Russian banks, call it the, the zero to three year type time frame. That's where they typically play. Um, so I think you continue to see volatility there. I mean, that's that's going to be absolutely insane. Um, the Fed, I mean, I don't think the Fed's going to be all that surprising. The Fed was really interesting three weeks ago, and now it's kind of boring. Um, you know, you're going to get 25 bips. You're going to get a little, you're going to get some guidance on QT. Nobody cares. Um, we've kind of moved on from that. But that's interesting Maybe. though, right? Two two months ago, 25 basis points was catastrophic, kind of. Yes. And now yeah. it's a fait accompli and nobody cares. Nobody cares. Uh, you had almost 700 jobs. It had 700,000 jobs uh, created in February and nobody, we didn't even talk about that. Yep. Right. Nobody cares. Um, cool. 700, right. 700K participation rate up, whatever. Um, so I think it's, uh, to Tracy's point, I think it's kind of a MOTS, right? More of the same. And okay. just until you get some sort of resolution and some sort of clarity on how long we're going to have these sanctions, you're, you're, this market is this market, right? Okay. It's going to be, it's going to continue to be highly volatile and there's, there's no end of it in sight. Okay. Very good. And then Albert, I'm going to ask you specifically about equities. So if we're getting more of the same, but we have... Uh, upward pressure on commodities. What do you think is going to happen domestically with U.S. equities? Do you think we're going to see more of the same volatility? Do you think, do we have a downside bias? Do we have, have an upside bias? Like, where do you see things over the next week? Well, I mean, it's hard. <laughs> it's hard to say that we have an upside bias at the moment with so much volatility. But, you know, from what I, from all my indications, I think Putin's going to up the war rhetoric and surge into Ukraine. I think equities are going to have to come down to I don't know, 4,200, 4,150, right? And then, then we start talking to the, start talking about the Fed, like Sam was talking, you know, 25 basis points was, you know, is now the consensus. But I will have to say, uh, Jerome Powell said, 
you know, he was look at, hoping that inflation is not a big problem when those meetings come. So don't be surprised if it's a 50 basis point hike. I, I think as an outlier, you could be right. You know, mm -hmm. I, I think it's a possibility. I think it's greater than 0%. Which if, 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 if we're talking about commodity super cycle, commodity surging with all this volatility in this war, how is inflation going to come down in the next couple of weeks? Well, one month, and, uh, just, just to ask a very direct question. A 50 basis point hike is intended to kill demand, right? Yes. That, that's all it's intended to do is kill demand. It's not- yeah, Of course. Okay. But from their perspective, you kill demand, you kill inflation. You know, I don't, I don't know if that's going to, I doubt it's going to work, but you know, that's, that's their narrative. Right. Okay. Very good. Guys, thank you very much. Uh, good luck in the next week. And for anybody viewing, don't forget about our CI futures uh, flash sale at completeintel.com slash promo and see you next week. Thank you. Thank Thanks. You. Thanks, Tony. Thank you.